Boyahun, Nelet Herain, Dan Karmenik, Siberia Farhun, Amar Nanedoras, Aragon, Nedim Dagor, Hen Urir Authori, Natha Dagathair. Then I shall die as one of them. Fire Emblem is probably a series that needs no introduction these days. For many, it's an old and celebrated franchise, while for others, it can be a major source of hype deflation. But for everyone else in between, Fire Emblem is a series of strategy role-playing games created by intelligent systems, and it's a series that spans multiple decades and over a dozen entries to date. The series has come a long way from its humble roots, and what was once a franchise on the verge of death has now blossomed into a household name. But because Fire Emblem is a series that spans so many different entries, a common question many newcomers will ask is this. If I want to get into Fire Emblem, which game makes a good starting point? And while it's easy to point to one or two games and call it a day, the truth is that Fire Emblem actually has many great starting points, and every game is worth checking out if you're genuinely interested in the series. As for my own experience with Fire Emblem, my story probably isn't too different from many of yours. Once upon a time, I was but a wee lad, and one fateful year, I was lucky enough to receive an awesome reward for playing in a band recital. I ripped open the package, popped the disc into my GameCube, and started a fresh playthrough of a game called Super Smash Bros. Melee. Like 99% of Melee players, I was wondering who the heck these two jabronis were. And while I did eventually become a Marth main for life, I wouldn't get a chance to play a proper Fire Emblem game until a few years later, when I picked up a copy of Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon. Since then, I've been an avid fan of the Fire Emblem series, and I've made my way through every mainline game in the series to date. But having said that, don't mistake my experience for expertise. I'm by no means a Fire Emblem expert, and if you've ever made a mistake playing Fire Emblem, I can guarantee you I've done the same exact thing. So as someone who's fallen into his fair share of pitfalls, the most I can do is act as a guide for those curious about the series. Maybe your first experience with the series isn't that different from my own, and your first intro to Fire Emblem is, say, Smash or Fire Emblem Heroes. Or, maybe you're a fan of medieval fantasy and JRPGs, and you're wondering if Fire Emblem is a good fit for you. Or, maybe you're no stranger to the series. Maybe you played one of the newer games and are wondering if the older games are worth checking out. Or maybe you're the opposite, and you're a longtime fan who's curious about getting back into the series. Fire Emblem is a series with a rich history behind it, and for better and for worse, the series has never been afraid to change and adapt. No two games are ever quite the same, and while it'd be a bit egregious to say Fire Emblem is a series for everyone, I do think there is something in Fire Emblem that can appeal to just about anyone. Let's say you're a fan of rich storytelling, complex characters, and a darker story that covers taboo topics. If any of that sounds interesting, then Fire Emblem has the perfect game for you. Or, if you're someone who craves tight gameplay where every decision counts, then Fire Emblem's got your back. And if you're someone who hates yourself and hates having fun, then Fire Emblem definitely has something up your alley. As for what you should expect moving forward, this video will be split into two sections. Part 1 will be fairly straightforward, and it'll cover what fans like me love about the series. Fire Emblem has had a devoted fanbase for decades, and if you ask a dozen fans what they love about the series, chances are you'll get a dozen different answers. This section will focus on just a few of those answers, like the writing and the gameplay. But Part 2 will be the real meat and potatoes, the games themselves. This section will be a brief overview of every mainline game in the series, and it'll explore why some games are absolutely worth playing, while others are worth playing eventually. As you might have guessed from the documentary length of this video, there's a lot to cover, so there will be timestamps and chapters for your convenience. And it goes without saying that from here on out, spoilers will be kept to a minimum. Most of each game's major plot points will be relegated to the early chapters, and as for everything else, the most you'll see will be either gameplay, extraneous world building, miscellaneous character supports, and scenes that otherwise need additional context. And lastly, and this should be obvious, but everything that follows is just one person's perspective. My word isn't gospel by any means, and the only thing that really matters is that you experience the series the way you want to. And with all the preliminary points addressed, let's dive right in. Fire Emblem is a series with a storied history, and even though the series has had its highs and lows, there's a reason it stood the test of time. Both the series and the fanbase have evolved over the years, and if Naga wills it, maybe you'll become a fan as well. When it comes to Fire Emblem, a common reason why fans are drawn to the series is the same as any other JRPG. The worlds, the stories, and the characters. As for the worlds themselves, swords and sorcery reign supreme, and the worlds are often populated with creatures like dragons, pegasi, and shapeshifters. But alongside the fantastical elements, politics and history are often fundamental aspects of each world. Many worlds in the series have extensive histories, and that worldbuilding plays a massive role in shaping each world's political situation. For example, in Fire Emblem Three Houses, descendants of legendary heroes can be born with a blessing called a crest. A crest bestows the wielder with immense strength, and they're often a sign of power and nobility throughout Fodlin. The crests are among the most important factors in shaping the world of Three Houses, and you can see similar concepts in other games, like with Holy Blood and Genealogy of the Holy War. And those are just two examples. 
One of the coolest things about the series is that many games have their own worlds and histories. And while there are similar ideas and trends, there's enough differences to give each game a unique identity. And while the worlds of Fire Emblem are one of the series' main draws, another one would be the stories in those worlds. Fire Emblem stories tend to follow a similar formula, where a young leader, typically of noble blood, builds an army, undergoes a myriad of military campaigns, and eventually saves the world from an evil emperor, dragon, or deity. Sometimes all three. But there are variations of this formula, and many entries aren't afraid to take the story in unique directions. Games like FE7 and FE9 tend to keep the scale small and focus on a select cast of characters. And in contrast, games like FE4 and FE10 are these massive, continent-spanning epics. Now, having said that, it should be mentioned that Fire Emblem stories can vary quite a bit. Most Fire Emblem stories tend to be pretty solid, but the most I can say is that you should temper your expectations. While Fire Emblem games are technically JRPGs, they're only JRPGs in the sense that they're Japanese games with role-playing elements. These games are first and foremost tactical and strategy RPGs, and if you go into most games expecting storytelling on the level of, say, the Mother series or a classic Final Fantasy game, you might find yourself disappointed. Fire Emblem stories are rarely bad, and they often have good story beats, fantastic themes and ideas, and defined character arcs. But the truth is, the series is also littered with tropes and writing issues, all of which affect the stories in various ways. Some examples of these issues and tropes include, but aren't limited to, evil wizard cults with the death of Saturday morning cartoon villains, player avatars with the personality of wet cardboard, mind control and or brainwashing as a substitute for compelling character motivation, contrived drama that would make soap opera writers jealous, and awful pacing. Just to give you a basic idea. In the spirit of keeping things simple, I'll group all these issues into something called dumb fire emblem storytelling. Some games avoid this better than others, and many actually make great use of established tropes and ideas. For example, FE4 is one of the better uses of dark wizard cults, and the story is more interesting as a result. But for every game that has strong writing or good use of series tropes, there's another case where the opposite is true. Like with most media, it will come down to your personal taste and preferences in the end. And whether or not you end up captivated by Fire Emblem stories, another reason why fans love the series are because of the characters in each story. Many of the main characters grow and change over the course of their journey, like how Martha and Roy grow from young men into leaders, or how Leaf and Micaiah need to learn how to grow in spite of their failures. And in addition to the main characters, the supporting cast of each game are full of strong characters of all sorts, with many of them having unique goals, relationships, and character arcs of their own. Some of the supporting characters are so good, they could easily have been the main character of their own game. But beyond the worlds, stories, and characters, the other main draw of Fire Emblem is the gameplay. As an SRPG, combat takes place on a grid-based map, and every map has a main objective you need to complete to progress through the game. Main objectives can include all sorts of conditions, like eliminating a boss, capturing a specific point, or one of my personal favorites, defending an area for a set number of turns. But where things get interesting are the various side objectives in each map. Side objectives tend to be optional and come in many forms, and they could be as simple as looting treasure, or as complicated as ensuring an allied army survives the map. As you play through a game, you'll need to learn how to balance side objectives while simultaneously pushing towards the main objective. But where it gets even more interesting are the objectives you set for yourself. Let's say a unit you really like is lagging behind, or you just got a new recruit you really want to try out. If you want, you could spend a map or two feeding them as much experience as possible, which could be tricky if the enemy armies are really strong. Or, maybe you're a little more familiar with the game's mechanics, and you're curious about how quickly you can clear a map. Or, maybe your goal is as simple as making sure everybody makes it out alive. Every one of those goals is a valid way to play a game, and the real beauty of Fire Emblem is managing every objective all at once. Fire Emblem is at its best when you need to balance main objectives, side objectives, and your personal objectives at the same time. And while it's definitely tricky to balance so many objectives all at once, it's extremely rewarding once you do. But as you play through a game, you'll learn early on that not everything goes according to plan. Mistakes can and will happen, and there will be times you'll have to make compromises. And that brings us to one of the series' most iconic traits, and perhaps the one Fire Emblem is best known for. Permadeath. Just like real life, the units in Fire Emblem die when they're killed. In most cases, if someone falls in battle, you won't be able to use them for the rest of the game. The existence of permadeath means that your actions will always matter, and if you make too many mistakes, then you'll have to pay the price in blood. Even with the easier entries, you need to be mindful of what you're doing, and do your best to think about the consequences of your next move. But even though permadeath is one of the series' most defining features, you do not need to power through every casualty. Sometimes you make an honest mistake, or maybe you misclick, miscalculate, or the game just decides it really doesn't like you that day. And if something like that ever happens, you can make a judgement call, you can reset and try again, or you can accept the loss and move on. Both options are valid, and it really just depends on how you approach the game. Replaying a map means sacrificing any progress and bonuses you may have earned, but if the unit who died was one of your MVPs, then a reset may be worth the trouble. Every game has a slightly different approach to permadeath, and in most cases, losing too many units won't be the end of the world. 
For example, games like Thracia, FE6, and Shadow Dragon all have large rosters, which means you'll always have units in case of emergencies. And while the later entries aren't balanced around permadeath as much, there are mechanics in place to help mitigate your mistakes. In most Fire Emblem entries, you will be able to make progress and finish the game no matter how battered your army gets. But the real magic of Fire Emblem is that there's so many different ways to play the game. Unless you're playing on the highest difficulties, most games aren't too hard, but even the easier games have those moments that make you pause and sit up a little straighter. But that neutral difficulty can change depending on your playstyle and preferences, and there's so many different ways to approach the series, all of which are fun in their own way. If you're someone who can't stand the thought of even losing one unit, then it's totally fine to reset until no man, woman, or creature gets left behind. The only reward for doing so is usually a pat on the back, but for some players, that's more than enough. Hell, that used to be the main way I played Fire Emblem, and even though I'm more lax with permadeath now, the thought of letting my units die still gives me a visceral reaction in the pit of my stomach. And if you're someone who craves a bit more challenge, you can always turn up the difficulty, or better yet, change up your run or playstyle. Iron Man runs, also known as runs without resetting, are a popular option for players looking for high risk and high rewards, and Iron Man runs can be done at any difficulty. And if you start to get a feel for a game's mechanics, it's always fun to try and finish maps as quickly as possible, which adds an additional layer of challenge and strategy. The really neat part is that you don't have to commit to a specific kind of run, and you can mix and match all sorts of playstyles for any kind of playthrough. For example, in most of my playthroughs, I generally try to keep everyone in the army alive, but if something goes wrong, I'm fine with taking the loss and moving on. And while I'm no low turn count player or speedrunner, I do try to play maps fairly quickly, because that kind of playstyle is just really fun to me. The main takeaway is that Fire Emblem is as fun and challenging as you make it. The games are simple to pick up, but tricky to master, and they offer a lot of depth if you're willing to go the distance. There's almost an infinite number of ways to play Fire Emblem, and the only wrong way to play is the one where you aren't having fun. And that gets into one of the best parts of the series, and the one that's my personal favorite. The Fire Emblem stories you create. The combination of memorable characters, strategy-based gameplay, and playstyle flexibility means that every single playthrough will be unique, and the best narratives are often the ones you write yourself. If you ask any fan about a memorable experience with the series, I'm sure they could think of at least a dozen, like those units who grew from scrubs to superstars, the heroes who fell in battle, or those high-stakes moments where they clutched victory from the jaws of defeat. For example, it's been over a decade since my very first playthrough, but I still remember the first time I let units die. These two may be some of the most forgettable units in the series, but I don't think I'll ever forget that feeling where I had to choose between their lives or victory. And in all the playthroughs I've done over the years, there's always a few units I'll try to use no matter what. They might not be the best units, and they're usually more trouble than they're worth, but I like using them, and that's as good a reason as any. And there's even a few units I always thought were nothing special, and they were often relegated to benchwarming on most playthroughs. But much to my surprise, this time around they put in mad work and far exceeded my expectations. More than anything else in the series, those unique moments and stories are what makes Fire Emblem, Fire Emblem. And if you decide to give the series a shot, I can guarantee you'll end up with a few stories of your own. So before getting into each game, it's best to be upfront about which games are the best starting points. In my own opinion, of course. As for the best overall starting points, consider Path of Radiance, Sacred Stones, Blazing Blade, and Awakening. These games all have a good balance of story and gameplay, and they're generally friendly to newcomers as well. Three Houses also makes the list as an honorable mention, as it also fits the aforementioned criteria. However, it should be mentioned that Three Houses deviates from the series formula quite a bit, but besides that, it's a solid place to start. And if you're someone who prefers story over gameplay, then consider Genealogy of the Holy War and Shadows of Valentia. These entries tend to prioritize their storytelling, but be warned that it does come at the cost of gameplay. Your mileage will vary on the gameplay, but if you want a memorable story, then these two are great options. And lastly, these are the games you should not start with. Thracia 776, Radiant Dawn, New Mystery of the Emblem, and Revelation. These games are either sequels, or otherwise require knowledge of another game. You're more than welcome to give these a try first, but having the extra background knowledge will make a difference. And as another important bullet point, we have to address something that affects many games in the series. Availability. In true Nintendo fashion, it's not exactly easy to play many games in the series. A lot of games haven't even been released outside of Japan, and for the ones that have, most copies don't come cheap. As such, it's not uncommon to resort to other measures if you want to play these games. Obviously, it can't help too much in this regard, but I will say it's not too hard to figure out. I was able to play most of the series on a good old fashioned Nintendo toaster, and that was a decade ago, so chances are you have all the hardware you need. And when in doubt, just play what's readily available to you. If you had a rich relative pass away and they left you a copy of Radiant Dawn in their will, then play Radiant Dawn. Call me old fashioned, but you shouldn't have to sell a kidney just to play a video game. If you really want to get into Fire Emblem, then do what you have to do, even if it means starting your journey in a really unorthodox way. And as a final point, there is the subject of translations. 
Without the hard work of incredibly talented translation teams, there's many games in the series we'd never be able to experience, and it's thanks to them that many classic games are now fully playable in the modern era. While I can't really help with some aspects of the installation process, I will post links to the relevant translations below, as well as any other useful links. And finally, we can get started on the series itself, and there's no better way to start than with the oldest games in the series, Fire Emblem 1 and Fire Emblem 2. I'm grouping these together because while they are quite different, they do share very similar talking points as NES games. FE1, better known as Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, is the story of Prince Marth, as he embarks on a quest to reclaim his kingdom from dark forces. Meanwhile, FE2, better known as Fire Emblem Gaiden, follows Almond Celica, two individuals who become involved in a continent-wide conflict. I'm keeping each synopsis brief because we'll be coming back to them in due time, but that about sums up the stories of FE1 and 2. As for the gameplay, these two share the same basic gameplay the series is known for, and what's remarkable is that the core gameplay still holds up. Even back in the NES days, Kaga and the team had something special, and you can feel that playing FE1 and 2. Sometimes. As the oldest entries, it's no surprise that these two are easily the most dated games in the series. The stories in these games are very bare bones, and the games boast clunky UIs and play very slowly compared to later games. And a lot of these issues are simply due to the time period. NES games weren't really known for great storytelling or stellar UIs, and FE1 and 2 made the most out of what was possible back then. So in short, FE1 and 2 are certainly playable, but your mileage on them will vary depending on how patient you are. I appreciate how the maps and basic mechanics hold up, but they are pretty rough around the edges, and there are better options for most players. FE1 and 2 have been blessed with fantastic remakes, and the remakes do a great job at retaining core mechanics, but giving the older games some much needed improvements. In most cases, the remakes are better options to experience the NES games, and most players will get more out of the remakes compared to the originals. And if you play the remakes and really enjoy them, it's worth going back and giving these two a shot. There's a certain charm to playing FE1 and 2 in their original formats, jankiness included, and it's pretty cool to experience a bit of Fire Emblem history. And speaking of remakes, that's as good a transition as any to the next game in the series, Fire Emblem 3, Mystery of the Emblem. Now, FE3 is a bit of a weird case, because on one hand, it shares many of the same qualities as FE1 and 2. While the UI is a big improvement over past games, it's still far from ideal, and the game still plays pretty slowly. And like FE1 and 2, FE3 has a very solid remake, and the remake is a great option for experiencing this story. But on the other hand, there is a case to be made for playing FE3 over its remake. For starters, FE3 is actually two games in one. FE3 is split into books, with Book 1 being a remake of FE1, and Book 2 being a proper sequel. It should be noted that Book 1 isn't a full remake, as it does cut some chapters and characters. But despite not being a complete remake, it is a more polished version of FE1, which makes Book 1 a good option over the original game. But the other advantage FE3 has over its remake is its story. When it comes to the remake, the core story was kept intact, but there's a few divisive changes. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but for the most part, FE3 is still a great way to experience Marth's second journey. As for the story itself, Book 2 takes place one year after Marth's last adventure. Marth and his allies did save the world, but there's still a lot that needs to be done for lasting peace. And to make matters worse, other kingdoms and factions have started fighting amongst themselves, and it's up to Marth to figure out what's going on and save the world once again. Now, there's actually a lot more to Book 2's story, but the most I can say is that the conflict is much more personal. Book 1 is a pretty black and white tale of good versus evil, whereas with Book 2, it's not quite so simple. As you may expect from an older entry, the main hurdle for playing FE3 will be the SNES clunkiness, but I will say it doesn't take too long to adjust, and it's certainly way more playable compared to FE1 and 2. But if FE3 looks and feels a little too archaic, then FE12 makes for a great alternative. And honestly, it's worth playing both FE3 and FE12. While they are similar, there's also enough qualities that make them feel like different experiences, like some of the mechanics unique to FE3. So in summation, FE3 is a great option if you want to experience the Arcanea stories, and don't mind some of the early series jankiness. FE3 is when the series really started to come into its own, and while FE12 does cast a pretty big shadow, there's still more than enough to FE3 that makes it worth playing today. And two years after FE3, we have the next entry for the SNES, Fire Emblem 4, Genealogy of the Holy War. As you may have gathered from the title, FE4 marks a big departure in terms of scope, as it was, and remains, one of the most ambitious entries to date. As for the story, the story of FE4 is one told in two parts, with part 1 centering on Sigurd, and part 2 centering on his son, Seleth. And when it comes to FE4, the story is where this game excels. FE4 is this massive epic, and one that's rife with political intrigue, mysteries, and darker themes. The story has a lot of moving parts to it, and part of what makes this game so memorable is watching how everything comes together. And when everything falls into place, many moments are bound to stay with you for years to come. But while the story of FE4 is solid, the gameplay is another matter entirely. 
This game features some of the largest maps in the series, and while it certainly captures the feeling of epic battles, actually playing FE4 isn't nearly as epic. This game really drags at times, and it can sour the overall experience. But that said, there's a lot to FE4 that gives it a unique charm. This game actually introduces mechanics that would go on to become series staples, like the weapon triangle. And of course, there's perhaps the most notable addition, which is the love system. FE4 is the first game in the series that allows you to pair units together and pass down growth rates, skills, and equipment to the next generation. The love system adds another layer of strategy to your playthrough, as you're expected to manage your current army while keeping in mind the army you'll have in the future. So when you put everything together, Genealogy of the Holy War makes for a very unique entry. The basic gameplay is the same as ever, but aspects like the story, the expansive maps, and the new mechanics give FE4 an experience unlike any other entry. If you're someone who wants to get invested in a grand, multi-generational epic, this is the game for you. Obviously, the game isn't perfect, and there are times where it really shows its age. For example, the game has a habit of telling you about important events as opposed to showing them, which weakens some aspects of the story. And just like the previous entries, you're going to have to pull out the pen and paper for battle calculations. But many of these so-called issues can be explained by the fact that FE4 was an SNES game. FE4 was really ambitious for its era, and it's still ambitious by today's standards. If FE4 ever gets a remake, I'm almost certain there'd be an attempt to add quality of life updates and give the story the cinematic flair that could really bring it to life. So in short, FE4 is a solid, flawed game, just like the other entries. It can be tedious and frustrating, and at the same time, dark, thrilling, and exceptionally memorable. This game pushed the boundaries of what the series was capable of, and it's a game every fan of the series should experience eventually. And coming after FE4 is the final entry on the SNES. Fire Emblem 5, Thracia 776. Thracia is unique in that it serves as an intercool to FE4. The game takes place in the year 776, or to be more specific, a time period between Part 1 and Part 2 of FE4. Thracia follows Selif's cousin, Leif, a young noble who plays a pivotal role in the events of FE4. Similar to Marth, Leif was forced into exile as a child, and Thracia is the story of Leif fighting back to reclaim his birthright. And what really ties Thracia's narrative together is the character writing. Leif is someone defined by his upbringing, his birthright, and most importantly, his flaws and he has a lot of growing to do before becoming a true leader. And Leaf isn't the only compelling character. Thracia has a really strong supporting cast, and many characters get their own storylines in the game. Some characters, like Laura and Sarah, have interesting backstories and revelations, while others, like Marita and Olwyn, undergo journeys of atonement and redemption. And I haven't even gotten to Thracia's gameplay. Thracia takes the core series gameplay, but adds a bunch of new mechanics and design choices. For example, Thracia is the first game to feature map objectives beyond seize and kill boss, and objectives like defend would go on to become series staples. But Thracia goes even further with its mechanics. In fact, there's so many new mechanics, it honestly takes way too much time to go over them all in detail. But just to give you a basic idea, here's a few examples of what you can expect in Thracia. The ability to capture enemies and steal their equipment. Fatigue, a mechanic that makes you bench units if you feel them too much. Infinite trading between units. Status stays with infinite range. Movement stars that can give units an additional action and a small chance for units to level up movement. And when you put all this together, it makes Thracia an absolutely wild game in the best way possible. Thracia is a game that lets you pull off insane plays that simply aren't possible in other games, like capturing a boss to steal their equipment, pickpocketing tomes from enemy mages, or stealing an entire ballista from the enemy army. And you better make use out of every single one of Thracia's mechanics, because if there's anything else this game is known for, it's the difficulty. Or to be more exact, Thracia's difficulty on a blind playthrough. Thracia can be one of the tougher entries if you're going in blind, and while it does become manageable with experience, the new mechanics in early game can give a nasty first impression. But if you're willing to learn how Thracia works, you'll find it's immensely rewarding. Thracia is a game that really pushes you, and even though it feels overwhelming at first, there will be a point where it just clicks. Some maps will look and feel like nightmares, but the game also gives you more than enough tools to tip the scales. If there's any game in the series that makes you fight back with everything you have, it's Thracia. If it wasn't obvious, I absolutely love this game, and for me, it represents what I look for in a great Fire Emblem game. Thracia has exceptional gameplay and a rewarding level of difficulty, and it's all tied together with one of the best narratives in the series. But as much as I love to just recommend Thracia and send you on your merry way, there is one caveat to it, which is the story. In order to get the most out of Thracia's story, it's highly, highly recommended you play Genealogy of the Holy War first. Thracia's story does work as a standalone story, but the additional context of FE4 does enhance the story of Thracia and vice versa for that matter. And in addition, Thracia straight up spoils major events of FE4, so it's just better to play FE4 to avoid any surprises. I'm obviously extremely biased, but Thracia is a phenomenal entry to this series. Every time I play Thracia, I have a blast, and every single playthrough has those moments that make you pop off like a madman. Like every other entry, it still has flaws, and I admit some aspects can be annoying, unnecessary, and downright infuriating, 
But the ratio succeeds far more than it fails, and even though it's not quite a perfect game, it perfectly encapsulates what I love about the series. And coming after the SNES era, we enter a new one with the first of the GBA entries. Fire Emblem 6, The Binding Blade. FE6 takes place on the continent of Elite, and while things were peaceful for a time, the world is thrust into peril as another kingdom begins their conquest. And it's up to none other than our boy, Roy, to lead an army and save the world from destruction. While the story of FE6 is reminiscent of previous entries, it's one that also makes the most out of its simple premise. Of the GBA games, this one is the most grounded and political, and aspects like the world, the history, and the main antagonist all enhance what would otherwise be a pretty forgettable story. And as for the gameplay of FE6, it's a much simpler game compared to Thracia. Mechanics like capturing and movement stars are gone, and instead of multiple map objectives, FE6 only has two, seize and kill boss. But a simpler game doesn't mean an easier one. While all the GBA titles play identically, FE6 is by far the toughest, and it's mostly because of a combination of unit balance and strong enemy armies. Roy's army isn't exactly made up of juggernauts, and it's very common to have one or two units do most of the heavy lifting. But while that may seem like a negative, it's really not. In some games, the enemy armies are so weak, some units can destroy entire battalions by themselves, and you can basically play the game in autopilot. But with games like FE6, you need to be careful and make your actions count. And overall, FE6 is just another solid game. The other GBA entries are a bit more suited to newcomers, but FE6 is worth getting to eventually. It's the most challenging of the GBA games, and while it can be very frustrating, it can also be just as rewarding. And that brings us to the second GBA entry, Fire Emblem 7, The Blazing Blade. FE7 has the honor of being the first entry released in the West, and this is where many fans fell in love with the series. In fact, I bet I can pinpoint the exact moment that happened for many fans. Oh no, not this moment, this one. As for the story, FE7 serves as a prequel to 6, but it's a very loose kind of prequel. The games are connected, but each game's story stands on its own, and you can play either game in any order. As for the story itself, FE7 can be split into two parts. The first part is centered around a young woman named Lynn, a proud warrior and survivor of a terrible tragedy. But once her story is over, the story shifts to Elliewood, the soon-to-be father of Roy. Elliewood's father has mysteriously disappeared, and together with Lynn and Elliewood's childhood friend Hector, the trio slowly unravel a plot that could threaten the fate of the world. While FE6 was a fairly grounded story, FE7 leans more into the fantasy side of Elib. To give you an example, in FE6, the main conflict was led by a man with strong ideals, while in FE7, the main driving force is a group of mages, assassins, and homunculi, all led by an evil sorcerer. And beyond the different style of story, the other distinction are the character dynamics of FE7. Instead of one lord, FE7 has three, and all three of them have unique personalities. Lynn and Hector tend to have strong, somewhat abrasive personalities, while Elliewood is usually the calm one who keeps the others in check. And this dynamic adds a lot of charm to FE7. The main trio feels like those friends who may not always get along, but they'll always have each other's back no matter what. And as far as FE7's gameplay, it generally plays similar to 6, but with a few minor changes. FE7 adds more main objectives to the rotation, like route and defend, and the enemies aren't as tough as they were in 6. This makes FE7 a more varied, easier kind of game, and it's bound to be way less frustrating for newcomers. While FE7 has lost a bit of its luster over time, this game is the one that hooked many, many fans, and to this day, you still see characters like Lynn and Hector dominate popularity polls. The legacy of FE7 cannot be understated, and if you're looking for a solid Fire Emblem experience, look no further than Blazing Blade. And that brings us to the final entry on the GBA, Fire Emblem 8, The Sacred Stones. FE8 takes place on the continent of Magville, and similar to Gaiden, we follow not one, but two characters, the kind but naive Erika, and her confident, reckless twin brother, Ephraim. Their kingdom's peace is broken when another kingdom mounts an invasion, and to make matters worse, monsters of legend have begun appearing throughout the lands. And in true series fashion, it's up to Erika and Ephraim to gather allies, reclaim their kingdom, and figure out the reason behind these mysterious events. As far as FE8's story goes, it doesn't deviate too much from the basic formula, but there's enough surprises there to keep you guessing until the end. And similar to FE7, this game really shines with its characters, as everyone from the supporting cast, the main characters, and even many of the antagonists all get ample time in the spotlight. But if there's any downside to FE8, it might be its difficulty. This is one of the easier games in the series, and even if you're playing on the highest difficulty, you won't run into many issues on most playthroughs. But the lower difficulty makes this a great game for newcomers, and if you're coming from an entry like, say, Awakening or Three Houses, this game has a lot of similar mechanics, like overworld battles and branching promotions. If you're curious about the older games, this game will be a very smooth transition. And if you're a complete series novice, this game is probably the best game in the series for a Fire Emblem trial run. The world and story of FE are very standalone, and the game isn't very long either. If you're looking for a solid, low commitment option, look no further than FE8. This game tends to get overshadowed by its predecessors, but make no mistake, FE8 is a great entry, 
It's the most polished of the GBA games, and it offers a good balance of story, characters, and gameplay variety. And coming after the GBA era, we have the first and only entry on the Nintendo GameCube, Fire Emblem 9, Path of Radiance. Path of Radiance takes place on the continent of Tellius, and the lands of Tellius are populated by two races, Bayork, which is more or less the Tellius term for humans, and Lagoos, powerful beings who can shapeshift into various creatures. Tensions have existed between Bayork and Lagoos for centuries, and even though there have been attempts to bring each race together, they're still a long way from true coexistence. As for the story itself, Path of Radiance follows Ike, the son of a renowned mercenary named Grail. Grail himself leads a company known as the Grail Mercenaries, and even though Ike is inexperienced now, he needs to be ready for the day when his father's company falls to his shoulders. But the story takes a turn when Ike meets a mysterious princess, and soon enough, the Grail Mercenaries find themselves in a conflict that could affect the fate of the world. As you might surmise from the lengthier synopsis, Path of Radiance is a game that really shines with its narrative and world building. It's a story that has the DNA of past entries, but tweaks familiar elements ever so slightly, creating a more unique kind of story. For example, in another universe, Alencia would have been the main character of this game, as she fits all the standard main character criteria. But Alencia's story is viewed through the lens of Ike, and Ike himself undergoes his own journey throughout the game. Path of Radiance is undeniably Ike's coming of age story, and one of the highlights of this game is watching him grow, whether it's him learning about racial slurs, or seeing him evolve into a true leader. And while Ike and Alencia are really strong characters, the same can be said about the entire supporting cast. Path of Radiance has one of the best ensembles in the series, and the Grail Mercs and Associates have everything from interesting backstories, complicated relationships, and strong character development. But as much as I could praise this game, I'd be remiss not to mention some of its shortcomings, most of which are with the gameplay. For one, just like FE8, Path of Radiance is one of the easier games in the series, assuming we refer to the English version. And while the lack of difficulty is actually a benefit for series newcomers, it does make the game feel a little dull at times, especially compared to other entries. And speaking of dull, one of the other issues with this game is the gameplay speed itself. Path of Radiance isn't exactly the fastest game in the series, and while it's totally fine for the earlier chapters, the game can really drag as the maps and enemy armies expand. But in the grand scheme of things, these issues are really minor. The story and characters are among the best in the series, if not the best, and the gameplay offers a solid balance of good map design, bonus objectives, and unit flexibility. Path of Radiance might not reach some of the gameplay highs of other entries, but it's very strong all around, and it's without a doubt one of the strongest games in the series. This game is genuinely the entire package, and if I could pick only one Fire Emblem game to show series newcomers, I would pick Path of Radiance, with absolutely zero hesitation. Path of Radiance is one of the best the series has to offer so far, and whether you're a series newcomer or series veteran, you owe it to yourself to experience the first part of the Telios duology. And coming after Path of Radiance is the direct sequel, Fire Emblem 10, Radiant Dawn. Radiant Dawn takes place three years after Path of Radiance, and instead of the Grail Mercenaries, the story begins with a woman named Micaiah. Micaiah belongs to a faction known as the Dawn Brigade, a group of vigilantes fighting back against an enemy empire. But Micaiah's path eventually leads her to a young man with noble blood, and soon enough, she embarks on a journey that's very similar to Ike's in the previous entry. But Micaiah and the Dawn Brigade is only one part of Radiant Dawn's story. After part one, conflicts arise that could threaten all of Tellius, and the story expands into one of truly epic scope. By the time part three begins, Radiant Dawn will be shifting between multiple factions, all of whom have their own reasons for fighting. As such, Radiant Dawn offers a story unlike any other so far, and of the games in the series, it's the one that truly captures the feel of a worldwide war. And Radiant Dawn isn't just an upgrade in terms of scale. Compared to Path of Radiance, Radiant Dawn not only plays faster, but is a big improvement in terms of map design and difficulty. The map layouts and objectives are much more varied, and while some player armies can face the enemy head on, others will be doing everything they can just to stay alive. And when you combine the difficulty and tighter map design, Radiant Dawn is a game where your actions really count. This game has a near-perfect mix of challenge and strategy-based gameplay, and when you add in the context of an epic story, <laughs> baby, you've got, got a stew, a stew going. going. But as much as I could go on about how good this game is, it's far from perfect. In fact, this is one case where the negatives can really stand out. While I praise Path of Radiance for its story and character writing, Radiant Dawn tends to fall short in both areas. The story is very grand and ambitious, but it's almost too ambitious, and it has a noticeable quality dip later on. Obviously mums the word on details, but the most I can say is that it veers into dumb Fire Emblem storytelling, which is something Path of Radiance largely avoided. And when it comes to character writing, what really hurts this game is the lack of proper support conversations. Supports do exist, but as far as most conversations go, the most you get are these really generic lines, where the characters say things like, Hey, don't you go dying on me. Thanks, you too. And this affects the entire cast, as returning characters don't have as much characterization as they used to, and the new characters are given scraps in terms of meaningful characterization. For example, I love Edward as much as the next guy. He's got mad promotion drip and he's my homeboy for life. But let's be real, he's a sword with a guy attached to it. Edward gets barely any characterization, and he's not the only character with this problem. 
Story events, base conversations, and unique supports do help, but they can only do so much, especially with such an enormous cast. And this isn't to say the character writing, or rather, lack thereof, always falls short, and Radiant Dawn has strong character writing where it counts, but those moments tend to be the exception, not the rule, and the minimal character writing hurts the majority of the cast. And as much as I praise the map design of Radiant Dawn, even that takes a nosedive later on, with most later maps having minimal gameplay variety. By the time part 4 rolls around, the story is lackluster, the maps are lackluster, and the game starts to feel like a real chore. And I don't say all this to throw shade at Radiant Dawn. While Thracia is probably my favorite game in the series, Radiant Dawn is a very close second. Hell, on a good day, Radiant Dawn is my favorite game in the series. For as often as this game falters, I'll always appreciate just how ambitious it was in the first place. For a series about war and conflict, the notion of exploring a global conflict from multiple perspectives is such an awesome idea, and I dream of the day when that style of storytelling returns. Radiant Dawn was a game that really aimed for the stars, and while it didn't quite stick the landing, it remains one of the most memorable, ambitious entries to date. This game is absolutely exhilarating at its best, and in those rare moments when the gameplay and story come together, it's one of the best games in the entire series. Radiant Dawn may not keep that momentum the entire time, but it's a worthy successor to Path of Radiance, and it remains an entry worth experiencing for yourself. And coming after the Tellius duology, we have the first entry on the DS, Fire Emblem 11, Shadow Dragon. As I mentioned earlier, Shadow Dragon is a remake of the original Fire Emblem, and similar to FE1 and Book 1 of FE3, the story follows Marth, a noble forcefully exiled from his kingdom. But Marth's exile is actually part of a much grander scheme involving a dark sorcerer and the resurrection of the titular Shadow Dragon. And as the world falls to darkness, it's up to Marth to reclaim his kingdom, defeat the evil forces, and save the lands of Arcanea. As for the gameplay of Shadow Dragon, it's largely a modernized version of FE1 and Book 1. Many maps in the original game were recreated faithfully, and some mechanics, like Infinite Range Warp, returned as well. But Shadow Dragon also adds additional mechanics and changes, some of which are simply modern updates, while others are new mechanics entirely. For example, Shadow Dragon adds in the Weapon Triangle, which never existed in FE1, and the game plays much faster than the original game. But perhaps the biggest change is the addition of free reclassing, where you're able to freely change unit classes between chapters. This adds a lot of versatility to your army, as you can always swap to the right classes for the right situations. The only real issues with Shadow Dragon are similar to those found in the original. While the story is an improvement over FE1 and Book 1, the story in question is still very vanilla. Marth's first adventure is the quintessential Fire Emblem story, and as a result, it lacks a lot of the intrigue, nuance, and creativity of the later entries, and you could say similar things about the characters. While Shadow Dragon does have solid characters, like say, Marth, Sita, and Minerva, most of the cast lacks meaningful characterization. Just like FE1, this game has no support conversations, which makes most of the cast feel like generic units with ugly portraits. But if you're willing to accept this game's shortcomings, you'll find it's a pleasant experience. This game takes the rock-solid foundation of FE1, but adds a lot in terms of writing, gameplay, and modern updates. Shadow Dragon might not be the prettiest or most complex entry, but this game thrives off its simplicity, and there's no better way to experience the War of Shadows in its entirety. And after FE1's remake, the DS era continues with the remake of FE3. Fire Emblem 12, New Mystery of the Emblem. Just like the original game, New Mystery takes place one year after the War of Shadows. Arcanea is in a state of restoration, but soon enough, events are set in motion that force Mark to take action. A rebellion has broken out in a nearby kingdom, but it's apparent not everything is what it seems, and just like the previous war, it's up to Marth to unravel each mystery and save Arcanea once again. As I mentioned with the FE3 section, the biggest difference between Marth's stories is the more personal nature of the War of Heroes. A recurring theme in the series is gathering allies from all walks of life, and it's that camaraderie that led Marth to victory in the last war. But in the War of Heroes, many of the opposing forces aren't just enemy armies, and they often include Marth's brothers and sisters in arms. Compared to the War of Shadows, this makes the War of Heroes a much richer, more compelling narrative. And in addition to a stronger narrative, the character writing is also noticeably improved in New Mystery, and by that, I mean it actually has character writing. New Mystery adds support conversations as well as base conversations, neither of which were in the original game. And while these supports aren't anything groundbreaking, they do go a long way to fleshing out the Arcanian cast. As for the gameplay, it's more or less identical to what we saw in Shadow Dragon. Mechanics like forging and free reclassing were carried over, and just like Shadow Dragon, the maps are faithful reimaginings of their original counterparts. So when you put all this together, New Mystery is yet another solid remake. It retains the story and map design of FE3, but adds modern updates that improve the original experience. New Mystery is a fantastic game, and just like its predecessor, it's the best way to experience the second chapter of the Arcanea Saga. Or at least, it would be, if not for one notable addition. Her? This game is the first entry to introduce a playable avatar, which is a unit you can customize as you see fit. And the idea of a playable avatar is fine on paper. They're in everything from Pokemon to Elden Ring, 
but it's an issue with New Mystery because in essence, the game is adding a character to a story where they never existed. To give you an example, let's say I wrote a story about King Arthur, and instead of writing a retelling of a classic story, I decided to add a new, original knight of the round table. This new knight doesn't really have a personality, but they're really loyal, really strong, and they somehow end up as one of King Arthur's most trusted friends and confidants. That's more or less what happens with the avatar in New Mystery, commonly known as Chris. Now, there's a lot that can be said about the inclusion of Chris, but the main issue is that it's just… awkward. It's really obvious this character doesn't belong in the story, and it doesn't help that they have no personality to speak of, which is by design. As an avatar, Chris was meant to be a blank slate for the player, and as such, they have about the bare minimum in terms of backstory and personality. Obviously, your mileage on Chris will vary, and while many players don't mind them, others can't stand them, and for good reason. I tend to feel somewhere in the middle, because while I don't like their inclusion, they do have some positives. The addition of a customizable unit adds a lot of replayability, and of the avatars in the series, I do like that Chris is just some rando, as opposed to being the second coming of Naga. And while I don't like the way Chris was handled in the story, I'm sure there was a way to implement them in a more effective manner. While I made a joke about adding a self-insert to an Arthurian story, that bit was actually inspired by a book series that did something really similar. In the Warlord Chronicles, the author took this relatively unknown figure and wove them into different retellings of Arthurian stories. And the books are really good, which shows that with a skilled writer, anything is possible, even if the idea sounds absurd on paper. And the other big positive is that Chris supports with the entire cast. While many of the Chris supports aren't anything special, it's still characterization for a cast with weak characterization, and Chris gives you a way to learn about everyone on the roster. But in the end, Chris tends to be a real monkey's paw situation, and while they do have some positives, they don't improve the story in a meaningful way. And if for any reason you can't tolerate Chris, FE3 is a good alternative. Even beyond Chris, New Mystery has a few minor changes compared to the original story, and while the changes usually aren't massive, the details do add up. FE3 is a complete, unabridged war of heroes, and if you're looking for the superior story, then play FE3. But overall, I see New Mystery as a net positive. It does include a lame player avatar, but that's a fair price for all the other additions, like more character writing, quality of life updates, and additional content, all of which weren't in the original game. And even though the story is weaker compared to the original game, it's still a good story. I always think it's cool when the series explores what happens during a war's aftermath, and just like Radiant Dawn, this story shows that the world doesn't improve overnight. Power struggles can cause rampant chaos, and men who were once good can fall to darkness. And as often as New Mystery falters with its writing, it's still a modern reimagining of a classic game, and a great one at that. New Mystery is a worthy addition to the series, and it makes for yet another solid chapter in the Arcanea saga. But technically, it wouldn't be the last Arcanean game. And after the Arcanea duology, we have the first entry in the 3DS era. Fire Emblem 13, Awakening. Awakening takes place in the same world as Arcanean games, but thousands of years later, where heroes like Marth, Alm, and Celica have faded into legend. Awakening is a story of two characters, the first being Krom, a lord of a kingdom known as Elise. One fateful day, Krom stumbles on a mysterious stranger named Robin, and soon enough, the two friends embark on a journey that affects kingdoms, the world, and even their futures. But Awakening's real claim to fame isn't its story. This game features a more expansive skill system, where similar to a traditional RPG, units will learn unique skills as they level up in specific classes. But Awakening's most defining feature is one finally making a return over a decade later, the love system. Just like FE4, Awakening allows you to pair units together and pass down modifiers, growths, and skills to a second generation, which makes this another game right for experimentation. But the freedom to experiment comes with a few trade-offs. Awakening has one of the most expansive support systems so far, and unlike past entries, there's no support limit. And the reason for this is simple, because if there are more support options, players have more freedom when it comes to unit pairings. But the downside of this is that Awakening opts with the quantity over quality approach. There are good characters and supports, but the game often defaults to the character's most basic traits, which makes the cast feel more one note than they actually are. Again, the good characters and supports are there, but there's also an abundance of gimmicky, one note writing. And as for the gameplay side of Awakening, the map design isn't too great either. Most main objectives are either route or kill boss, and the maps are often these big, open fields, with little room for actual strategy. But even though many of these traits are more on the critical side, I'd wager they're a huge reason why Awakening was so successful. At heart, Awakening is a simple game that appeals to many kinds of players, and almost anyone can find something here they enjoy. Awakening reminds me of a Hollywood blockbuster, and by that, I mean it's something that might not excel in any one area, but does a solid job at being good to decent in multiple areas, which creates a piece of media with a lot of widespread appeal. Awakening is very easy to pick up, it's very easy to understand, and there's just enough depth there for those who want a bit more complexity. Awakening may not soar as high as other entries in the series, but without Awakening, there wouldn't even be a series left to talk about. Awakening is one of the entries that drew in a lot of new fans, and if you're a newcomer, it's as good an entry point as it was ages ago. And if you're a series veteran, maybe it's worth giving it a shot.
You might not like everything it has to offer, but who knows, there's only one way to find out. And that brings us to the second 3DS entry, or rather, entries. Fire Emblem 14, Fates. Fates is a story of Korin, a half-dragon lore caught between two worlds. Prior to the start of the story, Korin was kidnapped as a child and raised in the Kingdom of Nor, a brutal kingdom led by an evil ruler. But Korin actually hails from the neighboring kingdom of Hoshido, and as tensions between each kingdom rise, Korin is faced with a decision. They can side with the family that raised them, or instead, side with the family they were born to. And this choice is reflected in each version of Fates. Birthright, Conquest, and Revelation. Each game represents a different path Korin takes, and beyond offering different narratives, each game also caters to different kinds of Fire Emblem players. But before getting into each game, I'm gonna rip a band-aid off right now. The stories of Fates are hot garbage. Remember how I mentioned dumb Fire Emblem storytelling? Well, Fates is kind of the poster child of that. These games suffer from basically every bad writing trick in the book, and then some. At best, the strongest story is generic and inoffensive. But as far as the worst, it reads like bad fanfiction. And I should know, I played that fanfiction. But having said all that, it's not worth harping on Fate's story for long. It's a horse that's been ground into pace by this point. Instead, it's best to move on and focus on the first of the Fate's trilogy, Birthright. Of the trilogy, Birthright is the one aimed at series newcomers and those who enjoyed the gameplay style of Awakening. Birthright is very much Awakening 2.0, as the two tend to share very similar design philosophies, especially in terms of map objectives and resource management. As such, many of the talking points with Awakening apply to Birthright as well, and it's a solid game for those who want a more simple, easygoing kind of entry. But while Awakening has the edge in story, Birthright is a notable improvement in terms of mechanics and gameplay. Something I didn't mention about Awakening is that it has more than a few broken mechanics, and Fates went the extra mile to rebalance the overtuned aspects. And not only does Birthright have the extra mechanical polish, but the map design is an improvement compared to Awakening. While there are still Awakening style maps, there's more variety in terms of map layouts, terrain, and side objectives. If you're someone who enjoyed the freedom and flexibility of Awakening, you're bound to enjoy your time with Birthright. And that brings us to the second entry of the Fates trilogy, Conquest. While Birthright was a game for those who enjoyed Awakening, Conquest is for those who love the classic games. Conquest harkens back to older entries, where the game moves from chapter to chapter, and resources like gold and equipment are more limited. Just like the older games, a core aspect of Conquest will be making the most out of what's available, like managing the best way to build your army. But far and away the best thing about Conquest is the map design. This game has the best maps among the 3DS entries, and it's not even close. It's the first entry since Radiant Dawn to feature map objectives beyond Seize, Kill Boss, and Route, and every map features a myriad of side objectives, map layouts, and unique map mechanics. Of course, not every map has the best design, and there's more than a few that make me wish I were playing Birthright instead. But Conquest is a blast to play. This game has a strong mechanical foundation of Fates, the resource management of a classic game, and brings it all together with stellar map design. This game easily makes my top 5 games in the series, and I'll tell you what, it's not number 5. I'll always acknowledge that the map design isn't perfect, and you'll never catch me defending some mechanics or the story. But I can't stress just how fun this game is once you get into it. Every time I play Conquest, I find something new to appreciate, like new strategies that totally work, or just how good the unit balance is. Yes, the abysmal story may prevent it from being a quote-unquote good game, and for many, a bad story is a legitimate deal-breaker. But do not be deterred by the story. On the basis of gameplay alone, Conquest is sublime, and it's by far the best game in the Fates trilogy. And closing out the Fates trilogy is the final entry, Revelation. While Birthright and Conquest represent Hoshido and Nor, Revelation represents a third path. Throughout the other Fates entries, there are hints that unseen forces are at work, an invisible kingdom, if you will. Revelation is where Korin refuses to side with either Hoshido or Nor, and instead, they choose to investigate the mysterious kingdom known as Vala. And beyond the story revelations, Revelation is the route that brings together both Hoshido and Nor. This game lets you use almost the entire roster of Fates, which makes it one of the best sandboxes in the series. As for Revelation's other positives? Eh, that's about it. Revelation is hands down the worst story of the Fates trilogy, and it's probably the worst story in the entire franchise. So far. But story issues aside, the real letdown of Revelation is the gameplay. Much of the game's first half are worse versions of maps and other routes, and to make matters worse, many maps include stupid mechanics that slow the game to a crawl. I know that sounds like hypocrisy on my part, since I just praised Conquest for having unique map mechanics. Both Conquest, most of the mechanics allow you to engage with the game, and there's an inherent back and forth that makes the maps feel interesting. But with Revelation, there's barely any of that back and forth. You're forced to play the game in the most boring, tedious way possible, and it ruins what could have been really solid gameplay. But as much as I'd like to say how Revelation isn't really worth playing, it still is, if only to finish off the Fates trilogy. The answers in Revelation aren't going to wow you, and even though the gameplay isn't anything special, Revelation does have unique maps and content, and for many, that alone makes it worth it. 
But in the end, it's no secret that Fates is one of the most divisive entries in the series, if not the most divisive, and for very valid reasons. The story is perhaps the biggest waste of potential in the franchise, not to mention aspects like a poorly written protagonist, or the way these games handle a second generation. But even though these games made many, many mistakes, the Fates trilogy did succeed in what they set out to accomplish. After Awakening, IS was in a tough spot as to where to take the next entry, and instead of catering to one fanbase over the other, they decided to make games that appeal to the entire fanbase, and against all odds, it actually worked. Birthright is a worthy successor to Awakening, and Conquest is a worthy successor to the older entries. And sure, Revelation is a series low point, but hey, that's two solid games out of three. Whether you're a series newcomer or a series veteran, there is a game in the Fates trilogy that will appeal to you, and I encourage you to at least give it a chance. And ending the 3DS era is another remake of a classic game, Fire Emblem 15, also known as Fire Emblem Echoes, Shadows of Valentia. SOV is a remake of Fire Emblem Gaiden, and just like Gaiden, SOV follows two central characters, a warrior named Alm, and a priestess named Selka. The two were very close friends as children, but as fate would have it, they were separated, and their destinies would take them in different directions. As for Alm, the drums of war quickly arrive on his doorstep, and soon enough, he joins an army known as the Deliverance, an army dedicated to fighting back against the Ruthless Empire. And as for Selica, her homelands have been suffering from crop failure, famine, and the invasion of monsters, and in spite of the danger around her, she embarks on a journey to uncover the truth behind her country's misfortune. As I alluded to earlier, the real highlight of SOV is the story. The original story in Gaiden was interesting, but it was mostly held back by the limitations of its era. But SOV takes the basic story of Gaiden and drastically improves it in just about every way. Lines of exposition are now full-fledged cutscenes, and all the characters have genuine personalities. The story of SOV is still far from perfect, but for all its faults, this is a beautiful reimagining of a classic story, and SOV adds the depth and characterization to really bring Gaiden's story to life. As for the gameplay, SOV is very much Gaiden, but with a modern coat of paint. Gaiden's dungeons are now fully explorable areas, and the basic gameplay has additions like forging, weapon arts, and modern updates. But if there's any glaring flaw with SOV, it's that it's a little too faithful. Just like the other remakes, SOV opted to recreate the maps in the original game, and Gaiden didn't have the strongest map design. As a result, many maps in SOV are these large, open areas, with minimal variety in main objectives, side objectives, and layouts. And besides the mediocre maps, many of the more frustrating Gaiden mechanics returned, like really obnoxious enemy types and strong terrain bonuses, just to name a few. While many of the new mechanics are much appreciated, the combination of data maps and mechanics can make SOV feel a little dull at times, if not downright annoying, just like Gaiden. And that's really what describes many of SOV's issues. There's a lot of love for Gaiden in this game, almost to a fault, and you can really feel that passion come through. SOV took the original foundation of Gaiden, but enhanced it with updates, new mechanics, and absolutely gorgeous presentation. Shadows of Valentia is a true classic brought to life, and it remains the best way to experience Gaiden in the modern era. And after the 3DS era, we have the first entry on the Nintendo Switch. Fire Emblem 16, Three Houses. More than any entry so far, this game marks the biggest departure in terms of series norms. Three Houses revolves around a mercenary named Byleth, a wanderer who becomes an instructor at Garrick Mock Monastery. The monastery functions as an academy of sorts, and among the students are three prominent figures. Edelgard of the Adresian Empire, Dimitri of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus, and Claude of the Leicester Alliance. While they may be young and inexperienced now, these three will one day become the most important leaders in Fodlin, and depending on their tutelage, they'll make for either powerful allies or dangerous enemies. And the tutelage in question isn't strictly metaphorical. One of three houses defining features is unit customization via instruction. Unlike past games, units aren't assigned to classes by default, and instead, they'll steadily grow into the classes you set for them. While everyone has inherent strengths and weaknesses, they're more like guidelines, and you can basically build your army however you see fit. And in addition to the new class system, the general gameplay loop is also quite different. Instead of moving from mission to mission, Three Houses operates on a calendar system, where most story missions take place during the latter weeks of a month. But you can spend the weeks between missions doing all sorts of activities, like minigames, training Byleth, or building supports between units. And the cherry on top are all the new additions to the basic Fire Emblem formula. This entry features a combination of returning features, like weapon arts and Thracia trading, as well as a host of new ones, like battalions. If there's anything this entry has in spades, it's in the options available to the player, and a huge appeal of this game is how far you're willing to take the sandbox it gives you. But I'd be remiss not to mention one of the game's strongest assets, which are the characters. This entry boasts one of the strongest casts in the series, and that applies to everyone from the main trio to the ensemble of supporting characters. The bloody history of Fobin is something that had a profound impact on just about everyone, and over the course of the story, you'll learn just how deep those scars are. Of course, there are still moments of weak writing, like with some characters or antagonists, after all, it just wouldn't be a proper Fire Emblem game without cartoony one-note villains. 
but the weaker characters tend to be outliers, and the strong character writing overall is one of the reasons why this game is beloved. But as much as Three Houses does right, there's also a lot of places where it struggles. There's quite a few genuine issues with the game, like for example, the pacing of the story, or the game's less than stellar map design. But that's a conversation for another day. Instead, many of the game's biggest issues can be grouped as such. Overambition, and Byleth. As you may have gathered from the overview, this is a very ambitious game, and you can definitely tell the devs' ambition exceeded their grasp. The most obvious example of this is the sheer amount of reused content, both in terms of story and gameplay. While there are four routes within the game, there's only enough content available for about half of that, which makes each route feel more homogenous than you're led to believe. It's blatantly apparent that this game either needed more development time, or needed to be scaled back to something like, say, one or two routes only. The initial premise of Three Houses was simply way too ambitious, and as it stands, the version that was released is repetitive at best, but rushed and unfinished at worst. As for the game's other main issue, it's both similar and different to issues that played previous entries. Just like similar characters in other games, Byleth's role is twofold. They're a central character in the story, and they function as an avatar for the player. In other words, they're effectively a blank slate, and right there lies the heart of the problem. No pun intended. Similar to previous avatars, Byleth has about the bare minimum in terms of backstory and personality, and while that was definitely a major issue in past games, that issue is exacerbated even more in this one. There's a lot of themes and layers to Three Houses story, but it's a story with character growth, dynamics, and relationships at its core. And when you have a story with characters as a focal point, you need characters with a defined personality. And not only does Byleth lack a strong, defined personality, but they're arguably one of the most important characters in the story. And when one of the most important characters is more or less a blank canvas, it weakens almost every aspect of the entire story. There are many points in Three Houses where Byleth contributes next to nothing, and it's really hard to feel invested at times when the conversations amount to the kind you'd seen a children's show. Do you like to go to school? Me too! And don't get me wrong, I'm well aware of the reasons why Byleth is the way they are. But the story justification isn't a good enough reason for why they're so underwritten. There's quite literally thousands of stories out there with characters who start out stoic or emotionally distant, just like Byleth, and they can be really compelling characters when written properly. I can even think of a few characters where having quote unquote no personality was used to great effect. Even within the Fire Emblem series, we have Ike as a stoic, emotionally distant mercenary, and he's fantastic. He's a really endearing character through a combination of his personality, his dynamic with others, and his development, and he's one of the reasons why Path of Radiance has such a strong story. But in the case of Three Houses, it's almost the opposite. Most of Three Houses' story issues are tied to Byleth, and the story mostly works in spite of them, rather than because of them. But as much as I could criticize Three Houses, I want to stress that it's not coming from a place of malice. Part of loving a piece of media means recognizing when it's being stupid, and this game can be both really awesome and really stupid. But as often as this game crumbles under its own weight, the good parts really outweigh the bad. From a writing perspective, the story reaches some of the highest highs of the series, and while it doesn't always remain at those highs, it's still some of the best writing among the modern games. And even though the maps and gameplay do get repetitive, the Three Houses sandbox is still fun to experiment with, and it's a game I'm always happy to revisit. Like Blazing Blade and Awakening before it, Three Houses brought in a lot of new fans to the series, and it's really easy to see why. This game has an awesome combination of gameplay variety, good storytelling, and best of all, an exceptional ensemble of characters. It deviates from series tradition more than any entry so far, but make no mistake, this is a Fire Emblem game through and through, and it's bound to appeal to series newcomers and veterans alike. And that brings us to the series' latest edition, Fire Emblem 17, Engage. This one will be a bit shorter, since at the time of recording, Engage is the most recent entry, and there's a lot worth experiencing for yourself. As for the story, Engage follows Alir, a divine dragon who's been asleep for a thousand years. But when they awaken, they find out the return of a fell dragon is nigh, and it's up to Alir to save the world from destruction. If the story sounds a little generic, then you'd be right on the money. Writing isn't really this game's strongest aspect, and it doesn't excel with either storytelling or character writing. But as for the gameplay, the most I'll say is this. Engage is the most fun I've had playing Fire Emblem in a long time, and if you're someone who wants to play some damn good Fire Emblem, play Engage. You won't regret it. Engage is a true celebration of the series, and one that celebrates both its high points and its low points. Engage is obviously not perfect, but no Fire Emblem game is perfect, and in a weird, perhaps unintentional way, Engage is the perfect kind of game to pay homage to this franchise. And over a dozen entries later, I want to make something really clear. It doesn't really matter where you start with Fire Emblem. The only thing that really matters is you give the series a chance at all. I know the series can look intimidating, complicated, and even uncomfortable at times, and I totally understand. I was in that same place at one point. And as a longtime fan, I still have those moments where I worry about the direction of the series. Every time a new game is announced, it feels like a roll of the dice to what kind of game we'll be getting. But at the end of it all, Fire Emblem was still here, and that counts for something. 
a series should never be judged purely on its faults, and as often as Fire Emblem falls short, it succeeds even more. Many older entries are just as good as they were years ago, and you can feel that legacy live on in every modern entry. There's an actual future for the franchise, and that means a lot for a series that at one point, didn't have a future at all. Fire Emblem is a rare series that's been by my side for most of my life, and while I could always complain about how much the series does wrong, it's a series I can always come back to, like an old friend. And with luck, it'll stay that way for a long, long time.